All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm William Roca. I am the new program director here at Village Preservation. And before we get started, I just do wanna give a little bit of a shout out to Maya Wilson who has been holding down the fort the last few months here at Village Preservation when they were in between program directors. So a big thank you to everything Maya has been doing the last few months. But we're very happy to have all of you here this evening. So as we get started here with introductory marks, please go down to the bottom there of your screen and let us know where you're coming in from. You know, where, where are you uh, zooming in from? If you haven't joined a village preservation program before, just a few notes that I'm going to read off here about village preservation as an organization. We've been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We've worked to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development, while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We've secured landmark designation for more than 1,250 buildings in the neighborhoods and zoning protections for nearly 100 blocks. We host about 75 free programs a year online, and we're very much starting also in person again as well. Our events cover a wide range of topics on the history, architecture, and culture of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and Noho, and the important role that historic preservation plays in our communities and lives. We look at the role of everything from local small businesses to independent cultural institutions, civil rights, social justice movements, great artists, writers, musicals, dancers, and others connected to the creative legacy of our neighborhoods, as well as the irreplaceable and unique built environment of the area as well. We are a member-based organization, so your support is absolutely critical in enabling us to provide these programs for free. So please help us continue our advocacy work and preservation work as well. And now to introduce our speaker. This evening's speaker is Kevin McGruder, Associate Professor of History at Antioch College. His interest in community formation led to a career in community development with positions that included Program Director at Local Initiative Support Corporation, Director of Real Estate Development with the Abyssinian Development Corporation in Harlem, and Executive Director of Gay Men of African Descent here in New York City. Since the 1990s, he's been a member of the other countries, a New York City-based Black, Black Gay Men's Writing Collective that has published three anthologies, Other Countries, Black Gay Voices, Sojourner, Black Gay Voices in the Age of AIDS, and Voices Rising, celebrating 20 years of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender writing. Professor Magruder has a BA in economics from Harvard University, MBA in real estate finance from Columbia University, and a PhD in US history from City University of New York. He's also the author of Race and Real Estate, Conflict and Cooperation in Harlem, 1890 to 1920, and Philip Payton, the father of Black Harlem, and the editor of Home at Last, the collected writings of AIDS journalist Leroy Whitfield. So now I hand it over to Professor Magruder, a hearty welcome, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, William, and I appreciate uh, being invited back. I was here a few months ago speaking about the Abyssinian Baptist Church and its time in Harlem, uh, where it was from the 1860s until a little bit after 1900. And uh, today I'm going to be speaking about another aspect of my own personal history, which is other countries uh, writing collective. And I want to share some slides with you. And the this talk is primarily drawn from a 2005 article that I wrote uh, when I was in the doctoral program at CUNY, and it's called To Be Heard in Print, Black Gay Writers in 1980s New York. And this photograph is a photograph by uh, Robert Giard of 
some of the members of other countries writing collective in the 1980s and just to identify them uh the the person seated in the front is uh, Rodney Dilby. And then left to right in the back, David Prichette, Colin Robinson, Carlos Seguro, and Donald Woods. Um, New York City in the 1980s witnessed the establishment of several organizations founded for and by Black gay men. And among these organizations, were two writing groups, the Black Heart Collective and other countries. Begun in the 1980s by a group of Black gay men involved in the arts and in politics, the Black Heart Collective was followed after a few years by other countries, a writing workshop established in 1986. Other countries included several men who had been associated with the Black Heart Collective in its later years. And other countries eventually grew to include a writing workshop, a publishing program, as well as a performance program. The work created and presented by the Black gay men in the Black Heart Collective and in other countries represented continuing efforts by those men to make their presence known to both the Black communities and the gay communities, and to leave a record of their ideas and of their lives. And so what I want to do is give a little bit of background. The article that I wrote did not emphasize the links to the village, and so I'll be adding some of that as we go along. And some of this history, many of you are already familiar with, uh, most likely. Uh, but just to contextualize the work that I'm going to be discussing in the 80s by looking at what was happening in Black, in LGBTQ activism prior to that. And really, the reason I start there is because although these organizations focused on writing, they saw their writing as activism. And uh, and so it's important to I believe to contextualize that work in that in that regard. And you you probably know that the when we trace the beginning I guess of the modern LGBTQ movement uh, before Stonewall, uh, the Mattachine Society is one of the organizations that that we look at, and it was formed in 1950 by communist and labor activist Harry Hay. And they eventually organized protests at the UN and the White House against Cuban work camps for gay people, among other things. And this was their, uh, their journal, um, and that's Harry Hay. Lesbians formed the Daughters of Balotas in 1955 in San Francisco as a social alternative to lesbian bars, which were subject to raids and police harassment. And this is a cover of their journal. And I think you already see a thread here that these are activist organizations, but they're using text to share their information, reach out to other people. There's a biography that came out about a year ago um, a, about, um, uh the uh the playwright uh of Raisin in the Sun, whose name for some reason is escaping me now. Um and she wrote anonymously to the to the latter. Um and that's something that the the author um presented in that. And so these were organizations that people across the country were reaching out to. Um and as you know, particularly since this is village preservation, the village becomes a central point of this because of the Stonewall Rebellion. And it sparked a new wave of LGBTQ activism. In June of 1969, there was a Stonewall, there was an uprising at the Stonewall, and that's seen as the spark. Um, at that time, New York City's public morals laws 
had a uh, designation that places that attracted gay people uh, could lead to uh, that place uh, being declared, I believe it was disorderly, and people there could be arrested. The American Psychiatric Association listed homosexuality as a disease that time, and I believe that didn't change until uh, a decade or, or so after that. After Stonewall, there's a new wave of activism and the Gay Liberation Front was formed in 1969, first as an auxiliary of Mattachine society. They soon seceded from Mattachine and that's where the name Gay Liberation Front uh, came from. And so they represented a new, a new style of activism Black lesbians and gays were organizing as well, and so the National Coalition of Black Lesbian and Gays was formed in 1978 by A. Billy S. Jones Henning and Darlene Garner and Dolores P. Berry, and they had chapters or organization efforts in Washington, D.C., New York City, Chicago, Detroit, and other areas. And and so the Association of Black Gays was formed in 1975. The Committee of Black Gay Men was formed in 1978. And the Association of Black Gays was founded by Ron Grayson to fight against racial inequality in, the Lo in Los Angeles gay community. And, um, and that was an issue in many parts of the country um, that I uh, really came out in the 1970s. And that was uh, a challenge because I think as Black gay people, we felt that gays and lesbians were framing their Declaration for Rights in universal ways, but at least in the gay community, there was uh, quite a bit of discrimination that was going on. In, social sites and so that's part of what was was driving uh the association of black gay men uh the committee of, <clears throat> excuse me the committee of black gay men was created in 1979 by world gay conference in washington dc and the committee was interested in creating a national network for and by black gay men and they held a national conference in atlanta in 1980 Many of these Black gay men, I'm going to focus on that group because that's the focus of these writing organizations, often were looking to the past to see images of themselves. And the Harlem Renaissance is a place that they often started with. Um, in 1926, Fire, um, a journal, was published. It was meant to be a quarterly, but there was only one issue that that was ever published. Um, it was a who's who of the Harlem Renaissance with contributors, including Wallace Thurman, Zora Neale Hurston. The cover is by Aaron Douglas. The, it contained a story called Smoke Lilies and Jade, written by Richard Bruce Nugent, who's not as well known as other Harlem Renaissance writers, but he was the closest that you could come to in terms of what we might call today being out. Um, and in that story, there's a, the main character is a bisexual man named Beauty. And uh, so that's 1926. And so in the 70s and 80s, we were in some ways looking back. A, one of the latter publications of the Harlem Renaissance was in 1932. And it was Wallace Thurman's novel, Infants of the Spring. Wallace Thurman it, was the editor of Fire. And he was he was a gay man as well. In that novel, he has a main character called Paul Arbian, who is uh, it's a Roman Ocleth, and that's Richard Bruce Nugent, and even the name Paul Arbian, so R B in his initials, um, and that's 1932. And and then we were looking for gay subtext in the writings of Langston Hughes, Claude McKay and County Cullen as well. The Black gay male literary presence uh, as a form of activism uh, 
is symbolized by the in the 1977 publication of a Adrian Stanford's Black and Queer collection of poems dealing with racism, love, and sexuality. There's a tremendous growth in the Black lesbian literary presence um, in the 70s and the 80s, and Audre Lorde is at the center of that. Um, she published uh, in 1976 a poetry collection, Cole, in 1978, another collection, The Black Unicorn, and in the Cancer Journals in 1980, uh, uh, which is a collection of essays. And, and, and she was a major figure and one of the leaders in the formation of Kitchen Table Press. Uh, she and Barbara Smith founded that, and that's Barbara Smith on the left in this, in this picture. And the uh, subtitle was Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press, to enable, and they formed it to enable women of color to have their own publishing resource and they published works by Hattie Gossett, Barbara Smith, Beverly Smith, and Pat Parker. And they received wide recognition uh, in the anthology, This Bridge Call My Back, uh, which was first published in 1981. And they're very important in terms of the work that Black gay men went on to do because that inspired Black gay men in New York City um, in their work. And so the Black Heart Collective um, comes about, uh, there are three people who are principal parties in its formation. One of them is Fred Carl. And in this photograph, he's in the overalls. And he began working at Oscar Wilde Bookstore in the Village in 1980. And I interviewed him uh, for the 2005 article. And, and I'll just quote him. He he said that he got very familiar with the women of Kitchen Table Press. So Barbara and Beverly Smith, Hattie Gossett, Audrey Lord, not so much, Sherry McGrago, Gloria Antaldiwa. They were doing readings. And since I worked at the bookstore, I was hearing about their readings. And, and then he continues. And then Isaac, that's Isaac Jackson, came in. And I remember he and I had discussions that there was all this activity, lesbians of color, particularly black lesbians, but there wasn't anything like that happening for black gay men. So that was the impetus for starting something. And so that's um, Fred Carl uh, speaking. And Isaac Jackson, um, he grew up in New York. Uh, he was a product of what he described as a mixed marriage, a Southern black person and a West Indian. And he was working at that time uh, in the uh, early 80s for a New York media arts organization. But he also hosted a live radio show called Messages on WBAI, Pacifica Radio. Another uh, person that was part of this trio um, was Tony Crusoe, who was living in New York. He was a Chicago native, and he already had substantial experience working with Black nationalist groups in New York. Uh, but he had become increasingly frustrated at their inability to extend their interest in liberation beyond a race focus to include gays and lesbians. But he also noted the doctrinaire aspects of the New York chapter of the Committee of Black Gay Men, which had begun in the late 70s. And he said he remembered being criticized for wearing unmanly yellow socks to a meeting. And he was struck by the organization's aversion to working with women. And so they come together and they form the Black Heart Collective. Um, and in preparing for this, I found a 1983 New York native interview by Charles Michael Smith uh, with Isaac Jackson that I did not uh, find when I was working on that early article. And in that article, Isaac Jackson explains that Black Heart is a West Indian term that refers to a man who is a wise person, uh, someone who is a bit tuned in to things most that most people aren't. The collective began meeting in the summer of 1980, and it included musicians, dancers, painters, and writers. The 12 men, in addition to Isaac Jackson, Fred Carl, and Tony Crusoe, included Carrie Allen Johnson, Arthur Wilson, Yves Lubin, who was also known as Osoto Saint, and artist Armando Elaine. And 
crucial recall that each of us brought something to the group. I think all of us had the sensibility of wanting to do coalition building with women. Um, Carrie Allen Johnson was then a student at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York. And that's Carrie on the left with the hat on. And he observed, um, there were definitely two camps. Those of us who were doing a black identified, black lovers, black, black, black. And those of us who were more identified in the white gay community. And there were a few in the middle like Fred, I'm talking about Fred Carl. We were all struggling with the issue, not terribly tolerant of the other point of view and trying to figure out what being black and gay and self-aware meant in the eighties. And so in this photograph, it's uh, I mentioned Carrie Allen Johnson on the left. Next to him is Colin Robinson. And then seated is Alubade, and then Bert Hunter and Donald Woods. And those names will come up later. That's why I want to point them out in this, in this photograph. Um, I was wondering about a village connection to the Black Heart Collective, um, in part because by the time of the 90s, uh, you'll see with other countries, they're very um, village-based. Um, and I reached out to Carrie Allen Johnson uh, over the weekend, and he uh, he said, uh, I'm not sure Blackheart had a particular meeting space, though Isaac Jackson did try to create a home for it in, it, in, his browns, in the brownstone he was renting in Harlem. Maybe the brownstone belonged to Hattie Gossett, but maybe not. I certainly remember that one of our seminal performances was at the Brooklyn Muse, which was on Eastern Parkway in Franklin, I do believe. They decided to publish a journal and they issued a call for submissions and began reviewing those as a group. And at the same time, they had fundraisers consisting of combinations of music, dance, and readings by collective members. And those were held um, at Washington Square United Methodist Church in the village, the Brooklyn Muse, which is a performance space, and the Harlem State Office building. And the first issue uh, was published in the spring of 1982, and it's called Yemonya, and that's a Yoruba uh, god, the West African culture. And in an opening essay, some thoughts on Black gay liberation, Isaac Jackson observed, Black sexual politics is in its infancy, but already it is crucial to our development that women's and gay liberation theories and practices include us all. If Black and third world people are really going to shake off the burden of outside interference with our people's development, we have to understand, uh, understand how imperialism begins at home. They continued to meet and decided to publish a second journal um, two years later. That journal had a focus on the writing of prisoners and as a means of focusing on political issues broader than just black the black gay community and they did this with an understanding that black gay men were among the incarcerated and so they hoped to highlight the fact that the issues related to incarceration could be of concern to all black people and in looking at the process uh they mentioned that part of that lag between the two uh, journals was they had a harder time getting submissions and they really had to um, reach out uh, to get submissions. And so this is the cover of the, the second edition. And it, it's probably hard to see, but there it's based on a statistic that a quarter of Black men would be incarcerated at some time in their life. So each row has for men and then there's a black line signifying that that's one that would be incarcerated during their life. <clears throat> While they were 
working on this second journal, there was a movement within the collective, which was quite informal uh, to institutionalize it. And that was at the same time they began talking about a third journal. And, you know, there were some people who, for different reasons, probably they um, moved on to other things. Um, and that brought in another group of people. And among those was Colin Robinson. And he had come to New York from Trinidad. And he recalls, um, uh, have a, a quotation mixing there, missing there, but he says, I remember being invited to a meeting to talk about expanding Blackheart or involving new people. And in this picture, uh, this is Colin with the hat. This is filmmaker Marlon Riggs. And I recognize him, but I cannot remember his name. And I'm not sure who that is. So this is probably in the right around the time that Colin is, is joining Blackheart. Um, and the reason I mentioned Marlon Riggs, he's he's doing filmmaking. Um, I believe he was based in California, but there is a network of Black gay men that's developing, uh, artists, activists. Um, and so there's a conversation beyond these particular collectives with people who are doing work. And the third journal, Black Heart Three, The Telling of Us was published in 1985 and it reflects the changes. Um, it was of comparable length as, as the previous issues um, with, at 49 pages, but it had a glossy cover and the cover features portraits of famous black gay men including James Baldwin, Billy Strayhorn, Langston Hughes. And it signaled an evolution of the journal. And within the document, the changes in the collective are clear as well. Uh, Isaac Jackson continued as managing editor, uh, but Daniel Garrett and Colin Robinson joined him as Blackheart Three editors. And, and Isaac Jackson himself, after the third journal, moved on to other interests. And um, he's based in California now. And from what I can see online, working on harm reduction issues, when I did my 2005 article, I could not uh, locate him. And so I wasn't able to interview him for that article. Um, in the spring of 1986, Daniel Garrett distributed flyers calling for the creation of a new writer's workshop. And this is Daniel Garrett, the second from the right in this picture. This is Colin Robinson. And when I see this picture, I was wondering, well, who is Colin on the phone with here? Um, this is Donald Woods. Um, and uh, this is a Sato Saint. And this is Craig Harris. And so they all, um, many members of this workshop, which was to be called Other Countries, uh, came from the Black Heart uh, Collective. And the collective, Other Countries, took its name from James Baldwin's 1962 novel, Another Country, which included the character of a Black gay man. And their first meeting took place at the Lesbian and Gay Community Center on 13th Street, which is what it was called then. And, um, <clears throat> and they immediately um, that summer began a series of discussions, some around how they would be structured, would they have rotating mod moderators. Um, they, they formed as a writing workshop. And I think that's different from Blackheart as a collective of writers. And so their idea was people would bring their work it would be a peer critique that would happen during the workshops. And so they were discussing, should they have rotating moderators, one moderator? They discussed coming from Blackheart, which had published three journals. They began a discussion of, should they publish a journal? And that summer, they were going to have a, a meeting where they were going to make the decision. And Carrie Allen Johnson was not able to attend. And so he wrote a letter to them that he wanted read at that meeting. And in it, uh, he was advocating to publish a journal. And he, in the letter, he says, we have a responsibility to our community 
to allow our voices to be heard in print. And the time for that is now. They did decide to publish a journal and what made that possible because there were some people who were really against it. And I don't know if it was the Black Heart experience or um, I think some of it, some might have felt it was going to distract from the work of the workshop. And so the compromise was the journal will be published, but that work will be separate from the workshop. And they had a call for submissions that was issued. And so it wasn't just work coming from the workshop. It was a national call. And then they began fundraising activities. And this is probably around the time that I first became acquainted with other countries. I moved to New York in 1982 to go to Columbia Business School. And uh, a person I was dating knew somebody who was a member of other countries and they were having a fundraiser at uh, the Cotton Club, not the old one, but there was a new one on 125th Street um, west of Broadway that I'm not sure exists anymore because of Columbia's Manhattanville campus. But they had a, a fundraiser there and so they were having fundraisers at different um, venues. And the Cotton Club at that time, they had a, a gay night. Um, I think it was Friday evenings. And um, so they did that to raise money to cover the publishing costs. And this is at a time of increasing visibility of Black gay writers. Um, James Baldwin, who's the generation earlier, um, was well known um, to Black gay writers and others um, as a Black gay man, um, but other writers who were, and I'll say of our generation because I'm, I'm, this is my age cohort of the people who are starting other countries. Melvin Dixon, um, who uh, was a professor at Queens College, but was publishing um, novels and other, other literature. Uh, Samuel Delaney, um, who is also of that earlier generation, but um, was widely published. Essex Hemphill, who was based in Washington, but there was a network along the East Coast among Black gay men. And so some of these events, people from DC would come to, um, there was some connections in Boston as well. Um, and as probably, I think a signal that there was, um, a readership was the 1986 publication of In the Life, a Black Gay Anthology, uh, which was edited by Joseph Bean. And Joseph Bean, his, um, his kind of involvement is very similar to Fred Carl's. He was working at a gay bookstore in Philadelphia when he got the idea to uh, put together this anthology. And from what I understand, he pretty much did it single-handedly in terms of issuing a call, reviewing um, submissions, and then publishing this. And you know, I think some people might have assumed that other countries would feel, okay, this is competition, they beat us to it. But I think it was probably more affirmation that, that there's a lot of work out there and there are a lot of people interested in reading it. And so In the Life was a really important publication uh, for Black gay men. Um, the journal by other countries uh, was published in 1988. And uh, Carrie Allen Johnson was a managing editor. Uh, and there were several other editors. And so it really was a collective effort. And this is the cover of it. And um, the uh, that photograph, um, the lighter skinned man in it, which probably can't see all that well, is Alan Wright. And this is a Lubade who was in the earlier photograph that I had pointed out. And um, and I think I was not involved in other countries at this time, but I think that what the picture is trying to convey it is a um a kind of everyday picture of black gay men at home reading. Uh, in addition to the book that Alubade has, there's newspapers here. And so, it, you know, it's kind of like a Sunday morning or something like that. And so that's, I think that's an image that many people in 1988 and maybe even now aren't, 
aren't accustomed to seeing in terms of black gay men. The logo of the on the cover uh, of the countries has a link to the Black Heart Collective because it was designed by Tony Crusor. Tony um, uh, went on to form, he, he was, he's an architect. And so he was working at an architect, as an architect, um, but he designed this logo uh, that we, uh, we continue to use today. Um, the, the journal, Other Countries Black Gay Voices is what it's called. It came out in 1988. And in the introduction, there's this quote, other countries, is an embodiment of the passionate belief that the lives, voices, and visions of gay men of African heritage are inherently valuable. It is founded from the desire to create opportunities for our precious visions to be developed and shared with each other and with the rest of our communities. As our name intends, other countries is a celebration of the importance of difference. Not only the difference we share, but our internal diversity as a community. The many voices we speak with, the different paths and consciousness we bring to our commonality as gays, as men, and as people of African descent. It included a March 1987 interview uh, of Bayard Rustin by Redvers Jean-Marie, and that's uh, Redvers seated on the left there. Um, and Byrd Rustin on the right. And in it, uh, Byrd Rustin noted, I believe that because gay men are at this stage so burdened with this problem of AIDS, if handled correctly, they can utilize it for mobilizing themselves. And um, Byrd Rustin died later in uh, 1987, but I, you know, I do believe that that, that um, observation uh, was, accurate in terms of when you look at the the organizing of AIDS activists uh, that, that came about in the 80s and into the 90s. And um, other countries had a performance program. And this is a picture probably from the time around the time that the journal um, first came out. Um, and the photograph is from that time. I think the graphic is it's kind of a recreation of Daniel Garrett's um, first flyer. Daniel Garrett uh, did not stay connected with other countries past that first year. And so I think there, I can't remember what this was for, but the photograph itself is, is from those early, early days. And um, the workshop was Greenwich Village centered. Um, it met from five to seven every Saturday in the LGBTQ center um, for, and the, the room would vary. I, I got involved with other countries in probably about 1992 and uh, the room within the center would vary, um, but we always um, followed the workshop by going out to dinner at a restaurant right near the center. Um, and um, and so there was a social aspect in addition to the workshop aspect. Everybody didn't necessarily go out to dinner, but most did. And so we got to know each other well. Um, also, there were annual open readings at in June during the summer solstice and in December, the winter solstice. And those were also held at the center, usually in, I believe, in the network room, which was the big room on the, on the first floor at that time. Um, by the time I got involved with other countries, they had already made the decision to um, publish a second journal. And uh, Bert Hunter, Bert Michael Hunter on the left was the managing editor. And it was a team of editors working on in different genres that, that worked on this. And its title itself kind of shows how AIDS and HIV was affecting Black gay men, Sojourner, Black gay voices in the age of AIDS. And so 1993 is when it came out. That's before the antiretroviral drugs were available. And so um, AZT was the only, probably about the only um, medication. And a lot of people within the collective 
uh, were sick or or died. And that's what this cover is reflecting. And it has the names of people from from the collective um, who who had died in uh, the prior prior time. This uh, journal was uh, twice the size of, it was over 200 pages, whereas the first journal was a little more than 100 pages. And it, it had poetry, fiction, nonfiction. The earlier journal had a mix of that as well. There were more um, uh, visual art within it than the first uh, journal had. And so it was a bigger, much bigger book. Um, at the same time, the organization was involved in terms of um, community activism. Uh, we uh, marched in the uh, gay pride parade in New York City regularly, and this is a year when we had a we had a convertible, and um, and part of that is getting to what um, that theme about being visible, um, and so that was one opportunity to do that. We also attended the outright LGBTQ writers conference. And at that time, this is probably right after the journal came out and that's me in the middle, Bert Hunter on the left and then Robert Penn on the right, we had a board of directors. And so uh, we were all on, on the board of directors and this is outright had kind of a, a vendor's mark for people with books. And so we're manning the table um, with Sojourner that had just come out. And then this is, we had a t-shirt with the cover on it as well. Um, other Countries was formed in 1986. And that same year, another Black gay men's organization was formed in New York City, gay men of African descent. And some of the same people were involved. And you can see from this photograph, that's Colin Robinson on the left. And with him is Charles Angel, who Reverend Charles Angel, who was one of the founders of GMAT. And um, this is a demonstration related to the uh, the Supreme Court decision, the Hartwick decision. And so they were formed as a weekly discussion group, uh, Friday discussion group that began in people's apartments. And part of the impetus was the impact of HIV and AIDS, but there were much broader issues that were discussed. The they outgrew the apartments after probably the first year. Uh, the first GMAT meeting I went to was in 1987. It was at the center and um, they they grew from there. Colin became the first uh, paid uh, exec director at GMAT um, in the early 90s. And uh, I joined the board of GMAT in about 1996. And then I became exec director in 1997. And by that time, uh, there was a fair amount of funding for AIDS and HIV um, uh, prevention funding, and GMAT uh, got a considerable amount of money during that time. And our office initially was in the, by the time I was there, it was in the uh, Parish House of Washington Square United Methodist Church in the village. And then we moved to 14th Street, right at 6th Avenue. And then eventually in around 2000, we moved to Harlem uh, because we needed more space. Um, by 2000, other countries um, between deaths and people moving on to do other things, um, the there wasn't a lot of energy in the organization. And as I remember the workshop, um, sometimes did not have a lot of people there. And this was, at the time that I was the executive director of GMAT and I was still on the board of other countries and um, the board uh, asked, and I was part of that conversation, asked GMAT to assume other countries as a program of GMAT. And the thinking was GMAT had, we probably had a staff about um, 10 full-time and 10 part-time. And the idea was, well, that paid staff can kind of move it forward. Um, because it seemed like it wasn't moving forward in a volunteer basis. Um, it did not really happen that way. The workshop under GMAD, um, like really what I've been describing is people coming to these organizations out of certain um, 
being inspired motivation in certain ways and so if you don't have that um running a writer's workshop almost almost as a support group they did provide support but they weren't support groups and so um eventually the workshop just stopped meeting and um and this um this next section is kind of from my my memory and um of some conversations as i remember colin robinson um kind of organized the discussion about reviving uh other countries in around 2004 and he got technical assistance from a nonprofit organization that had a facilitator work with a group of us it's probably about six or eight people who had been involved in other countries and by that time i was in the grad uh doctoral program at cuny and um and then that really put together a plan for how we might relaunch um Chris Adams in the photograph, he was a writer and teacher, and he um, kind of issued calls for saying, well, we still need a workshop, we should start meeting. And um, out of that, um, eventually within that, um, Bert Hunter, the managing editor of Sojourner, uh, died in 2001. And he, his will had provided a bequest to other countries um, that was now subsumed by GMAT. And um, we, uh, the group of us that wanted to revive other countries, wanted to move forward independently. And so we requested from GMAT that, um, that we be able to reclaim our independence. And that was granted along with the bequest and um, that bequest uh, allowed us to move forward with the third journal, which was a little different than the first two. It's called Voices Rising, celebrating 20 years of Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender writing. And G. Winston James, uh, pictured here, was the editor. And it was a collaboration between Other Countries Press, which is the entity, the name that we use for the journals we have published, and then the Redbone, Redbone Press, which is an independent uh, LGBTQ press um, uh, that um, this book came out in 2007. And it is um, probably about 350 pages. Um, and it's true to its name, Black, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Writing. So it's not just Black gay men writers, it's that whole group of people in this um in this uh anthology um the the workshop was revived and began was meeting again at the center and um in about 2012 we decided to go virtual some of us uh not just me had moved out of new york um and uh, so i think that was one of the reasons so long before COVID, we were meeting virtually and we now meet the second and fourth Saturday of the month from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, last year, we reprinted uh, Black Gay Voices, the first journal, and Sojourner, the second journal. And that was done through Fire Press, which is a um, independent press that I manage. And then um, last December, uh, we had a win winter solstice reading done in collaboration with Makeda School for Art, Media, and Humanities that Catherine Chiris um, coordinates. And that came about because she did a, in the summer of 2022, she did a four-part workshop about other countries and its history. Um, and out of that, we talked about doing something face-to-face. -face. And so the solstice came up and we're now uh, beginning discussions of a solstice event in December to mark the 30th anniversary of the publication of Sojourner. Uh, this is this event is coming up October 6th, and it's uh, marking the publication of Sacred Spells, the collected works of Osoto Saint. And this is going to be at the LGBTQ Center. And uh, it's going to feature uh, writers Reginald Harris, Gary Paul Wright, Jewel Gomez, Michelle Callsberg, Pamela Sneed, 
Walter Holland, Guy Mark Foster, and Alan uh, Luther Wright. And so that's um, Friday, October 6th at 7 p.m. And I know the, the in-person part is sold out, but it's going to be virtual as well. And so you can register to attend virtually if you'd like. Um, there are many books that people who've come through other countries have have published, and these are just a few. Uh, Bite Marks by Terrence Taylor. This, I believe, is the first in a trilogy that he completed. And Terrence was the graphic designer for the first uh, other country's journal. Um, G. Winston James, the editor of Voices Rising, uh, published Shaming the Devil, uh, a collection of his work in 2009. And he, he has some other collections as well that he's done. Um, the in 2013, Black Gay Genius Answering Joseph Beam's Call uh, was published. It was edited by Stephen G. Fullwood and Charles Stevens. And neither one of them were uh, regular participants in other countries, but they were part of this network of Black gay men. Stephen Fullwood, uh, for many years, worked at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And there he created the Lesbian and Gay, Black Lesbian and Gay Archives and other countries. Papers are there. Gay Men of African Descent's collections collection is there too. Uh, Charles Stevens uh, now coordinates uh, a project called the Counter Narrative Project, based in Atlanta. So they both edited this co collection. Um, and then Carrie Allen Johnson last year published this novel, uh, Desire Lines. Then um, there are recent related histories um, that uh, discuss other countries or Black gay activism in New York. And one is Evidence of Being by Darius Boss that came out in 2018. And the subtitle is The Black Gay Cultural Renaissance and the Politics of Violence. Um, and then in 2020, To Make the Wounded Whole by Dan Royals came out. And the subtitle is The African-American Struggle Against HIV AIDS. And that title comes from the first line of the hymn, um, bomb, There is a Bomb in Gilead. And the line is, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. And I will let Colin Robinson, who uh, died in 2021, have the last word for this presentation. Uh, he observed the creation of other countries has also deliberately been about building a black gay institution, rising to the challenge of proving to ourselves and to the world that we can leave something valuable and permanent of our black gay lives and work for our future generations. Thank you. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. And Lorraine Hansberry was the playwright <laughs> whose name I could not remember earlier, who was a lesbian. Um, and so she was writing to the latter in uh, in the 1950s or early 60s. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Magruder, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. So everybody, if you have questions, please pop them right here into the chat, into the Q&A button. And just so you also see in the chat, Maya is popping in some other great resources. The article that Dr. McGruder was referencing that this uh, particular talk was uh, based on and another one talk that he gave previously before Harlem, the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Greenwich Village on the YouTube channel from Village Preservation. Any questions from anyone? Questions, comments? All right, so we have one question here. In the digital world, do you have an opinion about the role of Black LGBTQ organizations and what they could do to serve today, what purpose they can serve today? That's something that other countries uh, discussed at our workshop a week ago, well, uh, last Saturday, um, because our membership is the cohort 
of my age, I'm 66. And uh, we have had younger people come through, but not stay. And we were talking about our digital presence and how we need to use that more effectively. Um, I, in republishing uh, Sojourner and Black Gay Voices, my goal is eventually to have ebook versions of those available too. And so we, we really are kind of several steps behind in, in using the digital world, even in researching this. So in 2005, the reason I could not find Isaac Jackson um, and found him probably within a half hour uh, when working on this is because of the advances in terms of access to digital information. And so I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to use that, um, uh, both in terms of the work, but in terms of creating community as well. Um, and you know that's what we're doing with the fact that we're virtual. We meet virtually now. Although I do think there is still a need in New York to have a face-to-face -face workshop. And, uh, and I think uh, as we move forward, I, I'm hoping that we'll maybe at least do face-to-face -face quarterly or, you know, we'll see because there's the people who are in the workshop now, uh, except for one regular are, we knew each other in the nineties. And so that's what's kept us together. Flip side of that is when somebody who's in their twenties or thirties comes in and sees these old men who know all these inside stories that they don't know, we got to figure out how to welcome them, bring them in and see what they need to, to keep them there. And, and are you aware of any other gay writing, black gay writing collectives that operate today, new ones, fresh ones, ones that are growing? I am not aware of any, and that's not to say they don't exist, but I, I just don't don't know of them. And actually, I have a, a quick question myself, and, and pardon if you already answered it during the presentation, but you mentioned that the readings on the solstices what, what was the particular significance of doing those readings on the solstices, the, the winter and summer? Um, I'm not sure specifically, but in many cultures that those markers in terms of um, astronomy, it has cultural significance. And so I think that's where picking those dates came from uh what they meant for us is they were open reading so it's not just people from the workshop reading anybody could read and i saw it particularly once we revived the workshop as a way to remind people that we were here to welcome them in in different ways and um and when we did the um the solstice last december um you know, one of our, one of the people who was around, uh, he was in town from Japan. He's been in Japan since the nineties, but he, he came to it. And so this, it's a, a way to bring people together too. And... Then we have. Oh yes. Okay. So if there's another question here, if you could touch upon any anecdotal um, information how you and the collective viewed and experienced the village in an LGBTQ landscape? By the 90s, um, my, and in, in the 80s, really, the, the social scene in the village was very Black, um, even though kind of if you look at, if I put my MBA hat on, if you look at what we owned, not much, but in terms of on the street, who's walking down the street? Paris is burning is based on those Black and Latino uh, LGBTQ people who were on the piers on West Street in the 80s, voguing. And that was the, you know, the kind of the, the, the trope was a child in the outer borough sneaking out the house, getting on the train, coming out 
at Christopher Street or at West 4th Street and cha has changed clothes on the train and now is who they really want to be. And that was how it felt. Um, I had a friend, I have a friend, we grew up together in Toledo, but we were both in New York at the time and our standard operating would be to go to Keller's on West Street which is a bar um, that Black men frequented, and then go to Peter Rabbit's, which was a dance club down, down the street from it. And, you know, and so there was that, that kind of feeling um, by the 2000s that had, had changed uh, quite a bit. And there was a concerted effort to push um, Black and Latino people off the street. And at one point, the police had a cleave like on Christopher Street, um, there was a a bar called um, I think Two Potato was one. There's another one I just can't remember, but it was also on Christopher Street. And and what was also happening is um, people who weren't gay were moving to the community, to to the village, and they were complaining about all these people on the street. And so the police were addressing those complaints, and they were really pushing people away from there. Um, but in the 90s and 80s and 90s, it was a very Black and Latino social scene there. I think this will then be our last question for the evening. What do you recall the most about organizing and writing in the 80s, 90s, for you personally and professionally? that um a lot of it is relationship based um so last night at antioch uh we had uh dr janetta cole the former president of spellman she was speaking about intergenerational um feminism and somebody asked her uh, some of the point about organizing among women and she talked about relational relationship based and so that's why i was pointing out who was in those pictures because sometimes you see them in different organizations, the same people. So Barbara Smith, um, Audrey Lord, those networks. And so the same thing is happening in the 80s and 90s is a lot of organizing is happening relationship based. So when I was at GMAT, we did a lot with African uh, Ancestral Lesbians United for Social Change, also called Salsa Soul, which is a Black lesbian organization um, because I knew Candace Boyce, I knew Kim Ford, um, the first Black Pride we did in 1996. It was about five or six organizations. We knew each other. So we trusted that we could work together. And I think sometimes people underestimate the importance of those relationships and think that the work itself is going to be enough to carry the day. But there has to be a level of trust and comfort uh, and also there has to be some fun happening and we had all of that um you know so the pride the marching in the pride parade that ended with the festival you know they moved it around but there's always parties and that's just as important as the activism um because otherwise you burn out and so those relationships um going to outright, it was kind of like a road trip for us. So yes, there was work that we were going to be doing, but we rented a car and we had fun during the weekend too. And so all of that was was part of the, you know, the work as well in terms of organizing. And similarly with GMAT, um, the Friday Forum, the reason why that was so important is because it was an opportunity outside of a club or a bar just to talk with people and meet them and see a wide range of being. <laughs> and that is not possible a lot of times when people are posturing and presenting and then you get to know people. And so, and then when you wanna do something, you can recruit people because they know you. And so I'm part of other countries because Colin Robinson asked me, I had a store on 125th Street in 1990 and 91. It was called Home to Harlem. And it was Harlem themed products, books, posters, and postcards. But we did a lot of events. And there's a parade in Harlem, the African-American Day Parade, that's usually, I think it's held in September. 
And GMAT always marched in that parade. And uh, because it was going to be in Harlem and my store was on 125th Street, I offered to hold a reception for them after the parade. And I was doing a lot of events. So Colin asked me to join the board, help work on the performance. And so it was those relationships that, you know, by that time, we knew each other well enough that, you know, I knew I could trust him. He knew he could trust me. And then the work we went on to do. And even when I joined GMAT's board, similarly, that was um, Colin knowing me and asking me. And, um, you know, there's other ways that we work together. And and so that that relationship is, I think, the foundation of doing any kind of good organizing work, I think. And Absolutely. Well, Professor Magruder, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and sharing this incredibly important piece of history as well. Thank you so much again. And many of the folks in the chat are sharing the absolute same sentiments as well. Before I wish everyone a good evening, uh, you will get a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording of this presentation. This will be available on the Village Preservation website for future viewing as well. So just head over to villagepreservation.org where you'll be able to access this, you know, the follow-up to this presentation, look at our future events, image archive, blog, et cetera. Please go there, take a look at everything. Dr. Magruder, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure listening thank to you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the invitation to come back. Absolutely. All I'm, right, I'm everyone. thinking about working on a, a project, that question about what life was like to really document what my memory is saying about the village in the 80s and 90s in oh. terms of Black gay life there. So that's, uh, I can't make promises on when it'll be done, but that's something I want to do. All right. Well, then we already got a future presentation lined up here for you. And when you help me back soon, then I hope. Yeah. All right. Thank you again so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And yeah, we look forward to having you join us at future events here at Village Preservation. Thank you and good night, everyone. Take care.